Hello, my name is Ke Xu, and I'm a 2016 Beckman Young investigator. Today, I'm glad to give you this presentation with the title of Probing Intracellular Physical Chemical Environments at the Nanometer Scale, One Molecule at a Time. Uh, as a background, over the past decade has been a surge of research in super-solution microscopy, in particular methods based on single molecule imaging, the idea is that even though the diffraction of a light creates a barrier for resolution, so you cannot resolve structures smaller than maybe 300 nanometer, uh, but if we can make the fluorescent molecule in a sample to blink on and off over time, then in each frame, there are only a few single molecules that we can comfortably localize their position. Then by gradually going through a lot of frames, we can capture the position of all the molecules to build up an image of very high resolution gradually, as shown on the right side. So this method is essentially a combination of single molecule blinking plus localization of the molecule and has been given a few names like storm, palm, uh, or another name is single molecule localization microscopy, SMLM. So this method can achieve resolution down to about 10 nanometers and also it has three-dimensional capability. My work over the past uh, few uh, years, in particular supported by the Beckman Young Investigator uh, Award, has been to push this type of method to go beyond the geometric dimension. The idea is that if we can do that, then we might be able to probe not only the structural information, but we can now start to probe other physical chemical parameters in cells and also chemical systems at nanometer resolution and single molecule sensitivity. For example, the local pH, chemical polarity, diffusivity, chemical reactions, protein interactions, and so on. Uh, this is a strategy that we give a name of functional super-resolution microscopy, or FSRM. If we want to do that, we reasoned we want to be able to encode one of those informations uh, into a new signal dimension. And in one approach that we have been very successful of uh, is to say each molecule, we already have the three-dimensional position plus time. Let's add the next dimension of the spectrum of each molecule, for example, the emission uh, spectrum of the molecule. Then we might be able to encode one of those functions into the emission spectrum of the molecule to get those information at the nanoscale. For that goal, we developed methods to collect a lot of single molecule spectrum, uh, as shown in here. On the left, single molecule are blinking, and we are looking at their single molecule images. At the same time, we have the spectrum dispersed in the X direction, and those spectrum are also blinking. As you can see, uh, the entirely is only 0.5 seconds of time, so it's actually a really fast blinking, and we collect a lot of blinking spectrum of all the molecules inside the sample. By doing so, in just one second, we can collect about 3,000 single molecule spectra. So in five million minutes, we can collect about one million single molecule spectra. This is a strategy we call ultra-high throughput single molecule spectroscopy. By having millions of single molecule spectra, we first showed we can use it through multicolor super-resolution imaging. Like in this image, we used four dyes uh, to label four different targets in the cell and draw up the uh, position of each molecule according to the determined position, but we color each molecule based on the spectral peak of each single molecule on this continuous color scale. And we immediately see there are roughly four uh, colors showing up in this image because we have four dyes. And we can actually look at those nanometer scale structures in the cell and find for each location because they are labeled by different dyes, we can recover very different single uh, molecule spectrum on average to uh, behave as an individual dye, telling us that we can uh, have a very good uh, resolution of both the space resolution and of the spectral resolution of single molecules inside the sample. So this is to show we can do multicolor imaging for uh, different dyes. The next goal is to say if we can further encode functions into the single molecule spectra. For this purpose, we want to be able to change the spectrum we measured into a function information at the nanometer scale by using a sensing probe molecule. 
for example, neon red is a polarity sensing dye. Uh, essentially, this particular fluorescent molecule, when you put it in solvents of different chemical polarity, then they can emit different colors. That even with I, you can see there's a color shift depending on the chemical polarity of the solvent, and the spectral shift is pretty large, up to 50 nanometer. So we use this dye to label the cell membranes and also did the spectrally resolved single molecule imaging to find out the spectrum of all the molecule together with position. After similarly drawing the position of each molecule and use a color to present the spectral emission of each molecule on this continual color scale, then we see this very nice colored map of local chemical polarity of the cell. So that in this cell, we see the outer plasma membrane is blue in color, but the internal membrane are yellow in color. Well, so blue and yellow in this case corresponded to this stretched color scale within the range of 612 to 648 nanometer. But above all, it tells us the plasma membrane has a low uh, emission wavelength. The initial membrane has a long emission wavelength. And that corresponding to, based on the property of this dye, tells us that the plasma membrane has a lower chemical polarity, while the internal membrane has a, a higher chemical polarity. So if we look at the average spectrum, there's a 15 nanometer uh, ish type of uh, red shift for the internal membrane. So this actually does match the function of the different type of membrane. If to say the organelle membranes like the ER and mitochondria, uh, they are more polar because they permit more water to pass through. So they are more flexible and allow more exchange inside the cell as opposed to the plasma membrane that shield the cell from the outside environment. We also were able to find out what drives this difference between the polarity uh, of the outer membrane and the inner membranes of the cell. By doing experiments that we deplete cholesterol, we can actually now drive everything yellow in color. So if we look at the dotted spectrum after removal of spectral, uh, cholesterol, then we see everything is actually red shifted similar to the internal uh, membrane of the cell in the beginning. But in the opposite direction, if we add a lot of cholesterol to cell, we can drive drive everything to the opposite direction. So now everything becomes blue, and even the plasma membrane now become even bluer than the starting uh, property of the membrane. So together, this result suggests that the difference polarity behavior of the plasma membrane versus the internal organelle membrane is due to the different cholesterol level. So that the plasma membrane started with a high cholesterol level. Uh, so that's, that's why they have a, a, a low chemical polarity as opposed to the internal membrane. It had low uh, 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 cholesterol level and because of that has a, a, a high chemical polarity. This does make sense because people do know cholesterol can help pack the membrane into a more ordered and a denser by layer and in that sense exclude water better to create a more hydrophobic environment. Uh, so together, our result was able to show there are differences between the different parts of the cell of the membrane. And also we have additional uh, uh, discussions of other nanoscale differences of the local polarity uh, that we discussed in our paper. Uh, if you're interested, please take a look. Uh, we also were able to use a similar strategy to look at nanometer scale structure and compositions of surface add layers. So in this case, we are looking at a mixture of trichloroethylene and chloroform as a mixture that we place it on glass and ask, uh, let it evaporate and it will leave residues of droplets as add layers on the surface. Using a similar strategy, we resolve this quite colorful, very interesting pattern of nanometer scale droplets of different colors. And if we zoom in to look at a part of the data, then we see that those different droplets uh, the smallest have the reddest color, the largest have the uh, bluest color, the magenta is on the blue side, and that actually corresponded to the pure uh, solvents uh, on the surface, but there are also a lot of intermediate cases, meaning those are mixtures of different uh, ratios of the two solvents on the surface. So together we were able to use this method to detect the, both the nanoscale structure and the compositions of those add-layer droplets on a glass surface. In a separate study, 
We also use a stra similar strategy to look at the single molecule reaction of a spiral pyrene. So this spiral pyrene is non-fluorescent uh, in the beginning, but it can automatically open ring to generate two isoforms that may have different uh, emission spectrum. But previously, it was very hard to tease out these two different emission patterns. Uh, we were able to monitor the position and the spectrum of single molecules on a cover slip. And by doing so, we were able to show by plotting the spectral position of each molecule in the x-axis and the brightness in the y-axis, that in the hexane, we indeed see two populations of the uh, fluorescent species of molecule corresponding to those different isoforms, whereas in water, it's dominated by one, by one isoform alone, meaning the uh, environment changed the reaction pathways for this single molecule reaction. Furthermore, we can also follow the behavior of individual molecules uh, that either kept as a single state for the wavelength uh, of emission, or it can cross between two states, between TTT and TTC. And also there are uh, more complicated behavior like going back and forth and switching and so on. So overall, we find this method can be a useful way to follow the reaction passes of single molecule through the spectral time traces. Over the past two years, we further expanded our method to develop a new dimension of measurement to measure the single molecule velocity and diffusivity. Essentially, we wanted to detect the motion of unbound single molecules inside the cell. Uh, this is very difficult because with conventional image, like maybe uh, with 10 millisecond time frame of camera, that of the typical camera that we can use, um, we see a lot of motion blur of single fluorescent molecules in live cells. They are very blurred image. We cannot really tell the shape or the behavior of molecule. So now if we do stroboscopic illumination by having the excitation at, uh, for a fraction of the entire frame length in each frame, then we can capture clear single molecule images because even though the frame time is still long, the exposure time is so short that we essentially freeze the image for that particular time point when the laser is on. However, this does not allow us to track the motion of molecules because even though for one image, the image is sharp, in a second image, the, time, the same frame time has passed after 10 milliseconds and those initial molecules are already out of focus by traveling maybe 700 nanometer within 10 milliseconds, then we can no longer see the same molecule even. So to overcome that limit, we designed a method to shift the excitation beam so that the first excitation is towards the end of the first frame and the second excitation is towards the front of the second frame. So now we can squeeze the time separation between the two pulses to about one millisecond or even shorter. If we do that, then we find within one millisecond, if in the first frame we saw two molecules, then after one millisecond, those two molecules are still within focus and they moved about 200 nanometers that we can comfortably localize. And by doing that, we can find out the displacement of those molecules with about 200 nanometer range of motion to roughly find out how fast each molecule are moving. But to be able to create a statistic result to find out the local diffusivity, what we did is to repeat this measurement a lot of times. So instead of just one pair of excitation, we did a lot, pair two, pair three, and so on. And by doing a lot of frames, we can gradually build up a local histogram of how fast the molecule are moving within a particular part of the sample. For example, for those two rectangular range of the sample, if we look at the build up histogram, we see very different histograms of how long the molecules have traveled within the one millisecond uh, time frame, And we can use mathematical model to fit to those data and find out they actually corresponded to different diffusion coefficient or diffusivity. Uh, they actually have a twofold difference for those two particular parts of the cell. Uh, we also were able to do fine binning based on this method to create a map of local diffusivity, uh, like for example, showing nucleus. So in this case, we bind uh, all the diffusion, local diffusion uh, single molecule result into bin size of 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer. And with each bin, we calculate a diffusion coefficient and uh, draw on a continuous color scale of zero to 30 
micrometer square per second to plot the local diffusivity. So this is showing in the nucleus, and this is outside of the nucleus. So based on this map, we see a few interesting behaviors based on our measurement is that we see inside the nucleus, there are parts where the diffusion is quite fast, maybe 20, 25 h of diffusivity, that is quite comparable to outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. Uh, but in the nucleolus, we see this magenta color, meaning very slow diffusivity for this glove, because there are a lot of high density of protein in that compartment, that makes sense. At the same time, we also see fast, slow regions of diffusion. Well, fast region already mentioned, but there are clusters of slow diffusivity. By imaging uh, the DNA using single molecule localization microscopy, we actually can correlate the result to see that all the slow diffusivity parts actually correspond to the high density of DNA. If we overlap them, they are uh, almost perfect uh, alignment between those two different structures. So that tells us that the chromatin ultra, ultra structure actually defines how fast single molecules, well, molecules move inside the nucleus so that a higher density of local chromatin would slow down diffusion due to the crowding effect of the DNA. Essentially, there could be structures like ketochromatin and other things that just very compact uh, and that uh, slow down the diffusion. So how about the property of the diffuser? That's another question we look at, and we found some very interesting results in there also. What we did is we look at a fluorescent protein called MEO 3.2, but we change the net charge of this protein on the surface. And what we find is that if we add in a lot of negative net charge to the protein, we do not change too much the diffusion behavior of this protein inside the cell. But if we start to put in positive charge onto this protein, then we see a very slow diffusivity. Uh, initially, it's like 25 mostly inside the cytoplasm, but with a positive seven charge, it becomes uh, smaller than 15 micrometers square per second. Similar result is also found in the nucleus. And if we put in positive 14 charge, the diffusivity is so slow, we have to use a 10 time smaller diffusivity range to plot it. Previously, it was on a color uh, range of 0 to 35, but now we have to plot on a 0 to 4 range to see the cytoplasm now have a diffusivity of about only 0.5 micrometer square per second, but the nucleus actually has a slightly higher diffusivity of about 2 to 3 micrometer square per second. So if we draw all those results together, um, we find uh, the, the, the uniform effect is to say, uh, if we look at different parts of the cell, including cytoplasm, nucleus, uh, acting bundles in cells, and also nucleolus, then the negative charge doesn't change too much their diffusion behavior. But when we start to put on positive charge, the diffusivity just drop down dramatically. So this is essentially a sign, a symmetric effect of net charge of the diffusivity of protein inside the cell. Uh, that is a, a, a fascinating discovery. And we had discussion of why that is the case in our paper. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, please take a look over there. So in conclusion, I hope I have shown uh, that the, our functional supersolution microscopy approach has indeed been able to go beyond the structure information or the shape information that the single molecule and structural uh, uh, supersolution microscopy have provided us. And the idea is to say, uh, as initially listed in our proposal, actually, of Beckman Young Investigator and the title of the presentation, by looking at single molecule uh, properties, one molecule at a, at a time, we can essentially capture new information of the physical chemical parameters in live cells and also other chemical uh, systems with really high sensitivity and also nanometer scale resolution. In particular, we showcased the, how powerful it is by being able to resolve the spectrum of each molecule, spectrally resolve single molecule uh, localization microscopy can help us look at the different uh, properties inside the cell and also look at chemical reactions at the single molecule level. And also our newer development of the velocity mapping, diffusivity mapping of single molecules 
uh, essentially because single molecule displacement and diffusivity mapping help us also uh, uh, unveil a lot of new information of the homogeneity in terms of diffusivity inside the cell. And for sure, there are many other dimensions and functionalities that we are interested in exploring. Some of them are listed in this plot, but there are a lot of other possibilities. Um, I also encourage you to take a look at our recent accounts and the uh, uh, current opinion uh, uh, articles discussing some of those aspects of why and how it is useful by looking at the single molecule properties, we can unveil new knowledge inside the cell and beyond. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, uh, my lab has developed quite a, a lot of those new techniques uh, from the scratch, and I'm really thankful for all the grad students and postdocs who work hard on all those projects. I would uh, also like to particularly acknowledge the, acknowledge, uh, the, the funding of the, from the Arnold and Marvel Beckman Foundation for my Beckman Young Investigator Award, which really enabled us to uh, do this very uh, interesting uh, uh, experiment to, to reveal a lot of fascinating secrets inside the cell and the chemical systems. Thank you very much. If you are interested in my work, uh, please take a look at my website, or if you have questions, you are welcome to uh, email me or find another way to find me and discuss maybe at the Beckman Symposium online through some ways. We'll find out. Great. Thank you very much. Then.